So this morning we're talking about a very important campaign, national campaign, Close the Gap um, in Indigenous Life Expectancy. Um, and Lower Tree Institute and others have been a, a proud part of the genesis and developing this campaign. Um, Jackie Huggins was going to join us this morning, but she's unfortunately a uh, apology. She's um, had terrible dramas with the airlines and also some family issues go on, so she sends her apologies, um, but wishes us well for a good session and a good conference. But thankfully, we have uh, two fabulous panellists who are going to help us discuss this issue, um, and I'll introduce um, the main speaker now, and then we'll ask um, Fadwa to come up, the other panellist, and we're going to have a, a discussion about where Close the Gap is at and where it might go and what needs to happen with it, and we'll have some time for question and answers and a general discussion among all of us. Uh, Richard Weston is the CEO of the Aboriginal Healing, uh, Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander Healing Foundation. He's a descendant of the Merriam people of the Torres Straits and has worked in Indigenous affairs for more than 20 years, 14 of these in Indigenous community controlled health services in far western New South Wales and Queensland. As the CEO of the Healing Foundation since 2010, Richard's overseen the strategic development of the organisation and has supported 135 culturally strong community-led Indigenous healing projects around the country. Prior to that, during his 13 years at Murray Ma Health in far western New South Wales, Richard led the delivery of high quality health care and improved health outcomes for adults and children alike. Um, and during that time, Murray Ma won five New South Wales health awards and a national one. Richard is currently, in addition to his duties at the Healing Foundation, the chair of the National Health Leadership Forum, which brings together many of our national Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander health peak organisations. Um, and he's also a senior member of the National Close the Gap Steering, uh, Close the Gap Campaign Steering Committee. He also works with Pat Dudgeon and others as an advisory committee, committee member on the National Empowerment Project and the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Suicide Prevention Evaluation Project. To give us an overview of Close the Gap's developments and progress, can you please make welcome Richard Weston? Yeah, thanks, Greg. Um, good morning, everyone. I am filling in for Jackie, um, and she does send her apologies. Um, unfortunately, her plane was cancelled, so she can't make it. Um, it's good to see you all up and around after last night. Well done. Um, look, it's been a great few days of this conference, and I want to start by paying my respect to the traditional owners of the, uh, the land that we're on, the never-ceded never country of the Kulin Nation. I want to thank uh, Garen Steele and Annie Dyer for their welcomes um, at the start of the conference. Um, you know, it's wonderful to be on your country and um, I want to acknowledge your elders, past and present and future. I'd also like to thank Lower Chiro Donoghue, Pat Anderson and Ron Mokak and his team at the Lower Chiro Institute for this wonderful conference. Opportunities to bring us all together to talk about the big health issues are precious and I know we're grateful for their collective leadership uh, makes us proud and we're, we're all proud to be here. Close the gap is a nice neat phrase we use to encapsulate a response to a level of inequality that a three word phrase can't really describe. Back in 2005, when Tommy Kelmer, Professor Tom Kelmer, called on all governments in Australia to commit to achieving equality in health status and life expectancy for our people, we were living nearly two, de two decades less than non-Indigenous Australians. In the early 2000s, the mortality rate for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander infants was three times that of non-Indigenous infants. In nearly every health and wellbeing measure, our people were way behind non-Indigenous people in this country. In one of the richest countries on earth, its first peoples were inhabiting a very different reality to the prosperity that most non-Indigenous Australians took for granted. Now, when we rattle off statistics and figures and facts, it can be easy to forget that every statistic is a person. 
a brother or mother or daughter or grandfather that we've lost. These are our people. Tom's seminal social justice report in 2005 was the starting point of a campaign to achieve health equality within 25 years. More than that, what Tom and the many other leaders began over 10 years ago was a movement to see the lives of our sisters, uncles, sons and cousins were to be truly accounted for and valued. That a country as wealthy as ours values the health of all of its people as a foundational principle and a statement of our character as a nation. I don't begrudge anyone being able to assume a standard of health care that provides the best chance of a long and healthy life. What I want and what we all want is for our people to be able to make the same assumptions, to also take for granted a world-beating health system that is culturally safe and committed to excellence for its first people. And as Greg said, the Close the Cap campaign has been led by Jackie Huggins um, and leadership of other people like Tom, Mick Gooder and Kirsty Parker. And they've been very critical in driving the work of this important campaign. The Close the Gap campaign is an internationally recognised public health campaign that brings together the best of intentions with a drive for meaningful action. So taking a few moments to reflect on Close the Gap, we have some achievements worth noting. Firstly, achieving bipartisan support from successive governments and oppositions to make closing the gap a national priority issue. The signing of the Statement of Intent in 2008 was an important step towards seeing our governments commit to health equality. Seeing government in introduce the Closing the Gap strategy in 2009 with a significant funding increase to address the critical areas needing attention. See, seeing nearly a quarter of a million fellow Australians sign up as supporters of the Close the Gap has been particularly encouraging and an indication of the importance of equality we all hold dear. The work of the National Health Leadership Forum, um, which I'm currently chairing, um, 14 national bodies. The NHLF has worked closely with government in the development of the implementation plan for the National Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Health Plan, which was launched in October last year. This in itself, this partnership, this collaborative approach with government um, is a first. The implementation plan is another important mechanism for planning and improving the way health is delivered to our people. And finally, the green shoots of improving health outcomes for our, for our people, such as the significant, significant increase in the number of health checks being undertaken. Our babies and infants are healthier, and we see the gap closing there in terms of mortality rates, and we now have better access to the medicines we need. All of these achievements, they're worth celebrating, but we are still so far from achieving health equality, which I think we all know. Our ongoing concern is that the limited improvements we have seen will lead to apathy, and we need to be as urgent as ever in our efforts to close the gap. Too many of our brothers and sisters still die too early from chronic disease, and our young people are tragically taking their own lives, choosing the heartbreaking decision to end pain themselves rather than live with the despair that is all too common. And yet we have hope. And I think one of the, um, the key messages out of this conference from, particularly from um, acknowledging our international guests, Moana and Karina Walters last night and uh, Chief Wilton, little child, yesterday, that we have hope. We are resilient and strong. From here in urban Melbourne, through to the small communities in northern and western Australia, there are men and women working for that better tomorrow. I have hope in the strong Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander leaders, particularly in health, that work tirelessly to champion the cause. We have hope in the thousands of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander health professionals working across this country 
in both our Aboriginal medical services and in mainstream services, bringing our strength in culture to the way health services are delivered. We are not alone. Many of our non-Indigenous brothers and sisters stand with us and we must acknowledge their alliance with us in achieving this, this target that we're trying to get to. Knowing we are all together in this, we have a responsibility to support each other. We have around 14 years to go in this campaign to close the gap in health equality. This is an intergenerational campaign an intergenerational effort is required to hold our governments to account. There's much to do, and I know we will inevitably face some big challenges over the next 14 years. But the opportunity and necessity is still there to bring health equality to our people within a generation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Richard. Um, Fadwa, would you like to join us? Um, I'm going to introduce our other eminent panellists now. Dr Fadwa Alyaman is a senior manager from the Australian Institute of Health and Welfare. Fadwa is responsible for the Institute's data collection, uh, development and reporting activities and stakeholder relationships in the area of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander health and welfare. She also has responsibility for the Closing the Gap Clearinghouse and the Online Indigenous Observatory. Fadwa has a wide-ranging experience in statistical analysis and reporting, demographic techniques, data development, data quality assessment and improvement, and in building strong collaborative relationships with key stakeholders. She has a strong research background in health and a keen interest in knowledge translation and the link between research policy and practice. She has a PhD in immunology from the John Curtin School of Medical Research and a Masters of Population Studies. Um, and also a Fulbright Fellow and the Australian Public Service Medal recipient in 2008. Please make welcome Dr. Alyaman. Thanks. Welcome to my office. I feel like this is my Oprah moment. <laughs> no. Look, these are really important issues, um, and obviously there are many experts in the room here who could, who could um, also um, add to this discussion, which we will come to in a second. Um, but thank you, Richard, in particular, for that um, good overview of where we're at um, and where it's come from, the campaign, and how much more work I think we all agree we still have to do as a country. But I wonder if I can ask you first... Um, one of the strengths of this campaign is it is a generational one. Um, the people who, and, and even before the campaign started, we should acknowledge the generations of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander health leaders who have called for health equity in one way or another and for social justice. But since the campaign started, one of the, um, and, and credit to Tom Calmer and others who were around to get the campaign off the ground, one of its strengths is the longevity and saying, look, we need a generational approach to this. But one of the difficulties in a 25-year campaign is maintaining interest. Um, tell me, what do you think about how we keep governments and the nation accountable and interested and committed? Good question, Greg. <laughs> <laughs> um, look, that is a challenge. I think... Um, you talked about the longevity of the campaign and, um, and that is, you know, that does give us time, I, I expect, and it is a generational effort. So I think it's really important that we, um, we have to take some lessons, I think, from our, you know, from our culture. Um, and I think there was some... Uh, really good um, points made in Karina Walters' um, presentation last night that I, I resonated with me and one of the ways to reflect on who we are and where we sit in this space in this generational campaign is, you know, it's, it's to think of ourselves as being part of a continuum of effort. You know, the, our culture's been in this country for thousands of years, so we need to draw strength from that. Um, and one of the, there, there were three questions that uh, Karina posed, I guess, that one was about what did our ancestors 
what sort of ancestors did, what did they want for us, what, what did they want us to be. Second question was about what sort of an ancestor do I want to be and then what sort of ancestors do we want our children to be. So I think they're very useful ways of us to start to think um, in terms of maintaining the rage, maintaining the effort and maintaining the, the, um, uh, the motivation to keep this campaign going. So I, I think we have to really support and make way for our younger leadership coming through. Um, they're the ones that will take this forward in the next, uh, you know, five, 10, 15 years. So we have to, from our own point of view, we have to sort of take, take control of what we, our sphere of influence, what we can control and what we can draw from. So we can draw from our own culture, our own history within ourselves to maintain that effort. And I think one of the other things that Karina said, we don't have the option of being apathetic. We don't have the option of um, saying, oh, it's all too hard. And um, we saw on day one um, Megan Davis's presentation on the, the history of advocacy in Australia for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders. And at every stage of every action of every piece of work that was going on, the organisations and the people involved, they kept asking for the same things. So we need to just keep up that, that effort and that's where we, we can draw our strength from. Um, you know, we saw the, the presentation from Chief Littlechild yesterday um, talking about, um, you know, survivors of their residential school system. We have our own survivors in this country, our stolen generations, and we need to be able to draw inspiration and strength from their story and their, um, you know, their survival and use that to drive us forward. Um, as far as keeping governments to account, I think we take a lesson out of our, our leadership um, and not just the, the current crop of leaders. We have, you know, uh, Tom Kalmer, Mick Gooder, um, Pat Anderson um, who do, and, um, you know, people on the NHLF, but, you know, Lower Chiro Donoghue, people have been there in the struggle over for so long and, and people have passed like... Um, Charlie Perkins, you know, he, he, he was a guy who, in spite of being in the bureaucracy, was always holding government to account. So we have to be, we have to be assertive um, and we have to continue to challenge our leadership. I think there are some, um, th there are some reasons for, uh, I guess, to be optimistic. We have... Um, uh, more Aboriginal people sitting in Parliament, in, in the Australian Parliament, than we've ever ha had. So we have to support and hope that they're able to make a difference from inside that, that place. Um, but we have to continue turning up. We have to continue p participating. We have to continue um, working with um, the health department and, and others in the space and continuing to... Um, to recognise that mainstream health has a responsibility to us and, and we have to keep making that point. Yeah, I think it's instructive what you're saying. Um, there is, as we know, a big difference between close the gap, which we're all very clear that we're on about and um, have called for clearly and closing the gap. Um, and I think what you're saying is right about um, following on from Karen's talk yesterday about culture and that we don't have the option to give up here. And some, I know, have called that the Close the Gap campaign perhaps hasn't achieved much, so we should just get rid of the whole thing. And I think that's a problem. I think what you're saying is right, is that we know what we want, but that doesn't mean we give up. We have to just recommit to getting that commitment from the other side. That's where it's falling down. And, and what you're saying about youth leadership, I think, and other leadership joining that effort is important. Um, Fadwa, can you tell us, um, from a statistical point of view, what, what specific improvements have we actually seen? Okay, thank you. First, I want to start acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we meet today and pay my respect to their elders past and present. Also, I want to thank Rom and his team for inviting me and for also having such a wonderful conference, which we're all enjoying. Um, I want to start three points before I talk about progress. The first one is around target setting. So basically, you can set absolute targets. So I can say, for example, smoking rate is currently 40%, and I want to have it uh, 
reduced to 20% in 10 years. That actually means that I can have a trajectory where I know that on average, I have to reduce smoking 2% um, annually in order to reach my target. This is one of the easiest way to do target settings. The COVAC targets are not that kind of targets because they focus on the gap between indigenous and non-indigenous Australians. And as such, you have really what we call a moving target. Because while we're trying to improve outcomes for indigenous Australians, non-indigenous Australians' outcomes are also improving. And so in order to close the gap between the two population groups, indigenous Australians' rates have to improve at much faster rate than the non-indigenous population. And so sometimes, even though there's been significant improvements in the, in, in the rates for indigenous Australians, the gap could widen because the non-indigenous rate is actually moving faster. So it's really important in that context to show what's happening in the indigenous population by itself. And then because the target is around the gap, then you, you can look at the gap because otherwise it can get discouraging if you just focus on the gap. So we need to be careful of what kind of benchmark population we want to have and what kind of target settings we want to have. The second point I want to make is how do we know whether we're on track or not? What we usually do is use historical data. For example, we'll have a smoking rate from 1994. So we plot the data and we project into the future where, we, where the end point is likely to be. So let's say 2020. So we just draw almost a straight line between where we're at now and 2020. And then every year when we get data, we look at it and see, is it on, is it on track to actually, are we on track to reach the target or not? So we can say we're on track or we're not on track. So if we were very far from the line that we have already projected, it means we're not going to reach that target. So that's our way of saying, yes, we're possibly on track or we're not on track. Taking into account that there could be variability and you can't decide from year to year, but you can see where the data is trending to tell you whether you're going to be on track or not. The third point I want to make is really around the COAG target and the value of these targets because they acknowledge two things. They acknowledge that you will not be able to close the health gap without addressing the social determinant, like education, employment. And so hence, there is a lot of focus on education and schooling. And the second thing that they acknowledge is you really have to start early to be able to close the gap later. And even it takes longer to close the gap, because we're talking about closing intergenerational gap, we start with the very young ones, and then by the time they're 18 or by the time they're 30 or 40, they're not getting the chronic diseases that we currently have, and as such, you'll be able to close the gap. So these are really, the COAG targets are really important, but at some stage, we can talk about the cultural determinant and the racism and the wellness concept from an indigenous perspective, which, which we are not currently measuring, really. So in relation to progress with the COAG targets, we have a mixed report card. So for two of the targets, we think we're on track to meet these targets. The child mortality one, which is half the gap in child mortality, zero to four year olds by 2018. We're currently within our trajectory line to actually be able to meet that target, which is really good news. Now, some people say targets, targets are really crude tools and you, do not, you don't know what to do, but actually that's not true because when you set the targets, you need to look at the drivers for these targets. For example, if we look at child mortality, we know that we're tracking in the right direction, but we also know what are the causes of child mortality? Where is it happening? So most child mortality happens in the first year of life, so we can focus on that a bit more. 80% of death during the zero to four years um, is during the first year of life. But also, what are kids dying from? They're still dying from injuries, which are preventable. They're dying from SIDS, which we've seen significant improvement, but it's still linked to smoking, and we can improve that as well. Low birth weight and preterm birth are also, um, you know, have higher mortality. So the target is, uh, you know, the decline in mortality or reduction in mortality, but actually we can look further into the data to see where are we going to focus our efforts? Which programs are we going to implement that works in order to help us reduce child mortality? So it is education, antenatal, postnatal care, parental support, home visitation, all these kind of things that we can work with. The second target, which is really, which we are likely to meet, is the year 12 attainment rate for 20 to 24 year olds by 2020. This is, we're looking based on our historical data and projection and baseline, we're actually likely to meet that target. And that's really good news because currently the, 
rate, the rate, rate 12 completion rate is about 62%, and we're likely to, to reach that target as well. Um, the, we have mixed results around the NAPLAN, which is called school achievement. School achievement, we're looking at almost eight measures, looking at reading and numeracy for year three, five, seven, and nine. And we're likely, based again on historical trends and existing data from the last data point that we looked at, we think we'll be able to meet the, read, the reading target uh, for year seven and uh, numeracy targets for three more years, year five, seven, and nine. So that's really good news. I mean, to meet the numeracy target is really important because you hear a lot of anecdotal evidence saying Aboriginal people don't like to work with numbers, but actually, the gap in numeracy is more likely to be reduced before the gap in reading. So it's, this you know, kind of addresses that myth around what Aboriginal people are good or not good at. Um, so two are we're likely to meet. One is mixed result. Two, we're not likely to meet the employment target and the life expectancy target. The life expectancy target has always been really a stretch target. Um, almost unrealistic in terms of its achievability because the amount of improvement in life expectancy required, we can't historically, we haven't seen historically that kind of improvement. So I'll give you an example. Between 2000 and, um, 2007 and 2010 to 12, the life expectancy for women increased by 0.6 years in order, over five year period. In order to close the gap for women between indigenous and non-indigenous women in life expectancy, you need to improve life expectancy 0.6 years per year. So it's way out of the range of the historical data that we've looked at. So that's going to, you know, that's going to be... The historical data for Aboriginal people specifically or in general for any population? The population and Aboriginal people. Right. And, and also don't forget that the non-Aboriginal population life expectancy is improving yeah. all the yeah. time as well. Yeah. 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 And the last two targets is school attendance and early childhood education and care. We actually don't have enough data points to reach, to, to really be able to say something about these targets, yeah. Thank you. So that's a good overview. I mean, obviously data and all its glory, there are strengths and limitations um, with it, and particularly in how you set the targets and who set the targets and who owns the measurement of the targets. Um, and I think what you're saying is very um, instructive about what we're measuring at the moment is a, um, the COAG targets seem to be useful from a political point of view to, to keep um, a discussion and a national interest going, whether or not they're the actual specific targets that will mean uh, improvements in health outcomes um, over time is another matter and how they're set, of course, is a big issue. Um, and who does the setting and measuring of those targets. But we're missing measuring two quite important things you said. One is cultural models of care and the other is systemic racism. And we know that they're two very big components of this picture. Um, Richard, from your point of view in the National Health Leadership Forum, what other challenges exist? Um, I mean, broader than the campaign, what are the challenges from that group's point of view um, in health and social equity and social justice in general? Well, I think you've touched on a couple of them there. Yeah. Um, and I, I think one of the, um, from my point of view, one of the striking things about the National Aboriginal Health Plan and the implementation plan is that we place culture at the centre of, center of um, you know, what we're, what we're trying to achieve. And the other element that I think is a um, significant um, part of the plan is to address racism. Um, we know that racism, um, you know, has a you know, hugely negative impact on our health and it has done for, um, you know, for many, many, many years. Um, so I think that, that that challenge is getting, you know, we're, we're really dealing with, firstly, with mainstream services to have them more accessible, more, um, more able to meet the needs of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders. So changing, getting some change in those systems is, um, is critical, um, but it's not an easy, it's not an easy task. But we do have members of the National Health Leadership Forum, our Nurses and Midwives Association and, and also the Allied Health, um, working on um, initiatives around cultural safety and uh, um, 
cultural competence and all of those those kind of uh, those kind of things. And um, you know, it's great to see us taking a lead on that and really engaging with um, uh, systems to to make them more um, more responsive um, and, and more accessible. But I think beyond that, in terms of ourself, is is our culture and, and how do we, you know, how how do we um, integrate our cultural knowledge and, and our um, our traditions into our into our work, so that our people are enabled um, to access services that are there. Um, Again, I'll, I'll just refer to Karina Walters' presentation yesterday when she was talking about a program around uh, diabetes and obesity and where they turned everything on its head and went back to a, um, walking a trail of tears and recapturing um, elements of their culture and uh, stories and song. And the strength of that was to create champions and leaders in, in communities um, to rebuild culture um, to you know take on the tradition of healing from this this great this historical trauma um, you know that they've experienced and by enabling and strengthening community around culture they started to get these other outcomes in terms of what they what the programs were about obesity and diabetes but they didn't use those terms they used culture so and I, I think we have the same opportunities here in Australia um, that we can start to even look at how our own Indigenous institutions are functioning and, and ask ourselves questions about what model are we using? Are we using, are we using a, a Western framework and putting an emu feather on it, as um, uh, Karina talked about, putting a feather on a, on a service, or are we, we actually turning that and we starting to design our own system from the ground up and using... Western, um, uh, um, you know, Western methodologies, Western, Western um, services to complement, complement that, and certainly that's in the work that the Healing Foundation has done. We've found the things that work best are when it's designed and developed by our own people um, at the local or regional level in a in a way that suits their environment and their their history, their trauma history, and um, and complemented by Western methodologies, not using a Western method methodology and then trying to culturalise it or Aboriginalise it or, or make it... Um, kind of tack the culture on at the end. Yeah, or we so have Aboriginal staff running a essentially biomedical model program. And that can be difficult for, for many of us because we are, we are being educated in these Western systems and that's mm. important. Um, but certainly starting to think a bit differently about how we get our culture at the centre, start there and tap into our, um, our, our traditional knowledge, our strength. Um, you know, the people that have survived, our elders, their knowledge, it, it's there we, and it's waiting for us. Um, and I think that that, to me, is one of the exciting things that we can do over the next 15 years is... Um, Go and address, start addressing this historical trauma that Karina Walters was talking about. We don't call it that, we call it intergenerational trauma, but it is a historical trauma and it, it, was, it was designed to destroy our identities and, yeah. and destroy our traditions. Yeah. Um, but it hasn't worked, we're still here, so we need to draw on that. Yeah. I think in the Australian public narrative, trauma is um, seen as, when we talk about trauma, it's seen as an excuse, but what we're actually saying is, no, it's the explanation. And, um, and as Karen was saying, it's actually our opportunity to rebuild our cultural models um, as we heal from that. Um, in a similar vein, Fadwa, um, Aboriginal, Richard was just talking about Aboriginal ownership and um, leadership and cultural models in the way we do programs. Can you tell us how the AIHW manages that in a data sense? How do you make sure that Aboriginal people are a part of the measurement, reporting, target setting? Um, I think the Institute um, is one of the institutes in Australia that does that well. <laughs> the ABS certainly doesn't, and others. But um, tell us how you engage with our communities and what are the challenges in that? Like for most of our work, we actually have advisory groups mm. that have majority Indigenous Australians. So, for mm -hmm. example, we had an Indigenous reference group for the burden of disease work, and we had 
various indigenous people, researchers working for government and others to actually advise us on our work. We do send the work out for people as well for review and comment and peer review out externally. So we have some, and we also go through the government structures. For example, Nagatsi Head, which is a, an advisory committee. You want the whole name? Yes, go on, <laughs> just for fun, just for kicks. Everyone awake? <laughs> what does Nagatsi Head That's why he's for? laughing. <laughs> he was traumatized by being on he it. He was traumatized by being on the committee, but anyway. Yeah, so it's the National Advisory Group on Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Health Information and Data. And it's got majority Indigenous Australians. Some of them are experts and some of them work for government, so it's different contexts. Yeah. Nacho has two seats on that committee. Mm -hmm. Richard used to be on it, but I think he decided to leave. <laughs> Because of trauma, as he says, <laughs> Some of our mob actually love data. You know, I know. It's not many, but some not do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah. Anyway, so, so we, do, we have to do things through the AMA committees because indigenous identification in, men, in um, the data set is one identifier across many, many other identifiers. For example, if you take hospital data, You'll have reasons for hospitalization, how many people went, how much does it cost, and all this information. And you'll have, you know, for example, cultural background, country of birth, but then you have indigenous status, yes, no, and non-indigenous. So our problem with a lot of these statuses is that we have one variable, is the quality of indigenous identification, because some people still don't ask the standard question. And we have to do what we call hospital audits and other techniques to try and have an idea what's the level of under-identification. Because when you're trying to measure the gap, it actually, if people are under-identified, it understates the gap, so you're not measuring accurately the gap. So what we found with our hospital data, for example, is that indigenous Australians are under-identified up to 10% in this data set, and identification is really excellent in remote and very remote area, and it progressively gets worse in urban areas. So we, what we can do with these numbers is adjust the hospital data, and then when we look at the gap, we're looking at more accurate data in terms of the gap. Thank you. Again, speaks to the strengths and limitations of data and, and, and how it can be useful, but just with the qualifications and the, um, and the adjustments that are required. Yeah. I want to ask you both, um, before we open it up to some questions, about, okay, so we've been going nine years now, I think the campaign's been going? Ten, Ten years. Um, Fifteen years to go. Um, probably not going to end there. We're probably going to have to, you know, um, morph it into some other campaign or to continue the campaign or to continue the social justice work in whatever form. What's one or two things that we need to do now to get meaningful action? I heard you say really clearly before that you know, Aboriginal peaks and organisations and communities are pretty clear on what needs to be done, but how can we bring the rest of Australia along with us? So I really think what you've, what you've said earlier is really around, we're seeing more and more Indigenous leadership, like looking at the agenda from an Indigenous perspective, and we want to be able to measure these perspectives really in our national data, because otherwise, It'll be, it'll be done, but we, don't, we won't have national national picture about what's happening. The issue around that really becomes, if you want to set targets or if you want to make sure that these things happen, they can, you will not have to have comparator. They can't be like, you know, gap targets. They've got to be, you know, within indigenous kind of targets that we want to reach this or that and so on. So I think there is quite a bit of momentum and a lot of engagement. I'm seeing really big engagement between indigenous and non-indigenous Australians and Indigenous people taking the lead on, for example, the cultural determinant, and only which is doing some work in that space. Uh, racism is on the implementation plan. Wellness and um, cultural competency is also in the implementation plan. So we'll be working, developing, working like with Indigenous people, developing these concepts. What, what, what does it mean? Can we have measures? What other countries have, what kind of measures exist in other countries and use that to create our own measures and report on them in the future. It'll take a bit of time, but I think the work is already happening, yeah. yeah. It's very important to make sure our comparators are not just always non-Indigenous because, you know, we don't just want Aboriginal people to, our young people to use suicide, for example. We don't just want to reach the same rate as non-Aboriginal people because that's too high. <laughs> yeah, we, want, we don't want any yet. Yeah, that's interesting. You know, we want to reduce violence against women. We don't want to stop it, but we just want to reduce it. But, um, don't want to stop it? <laughs> not what we do, but the, 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 the campaign's called Reducing. Um, 
Look, I, I think um, one or two things that we can do. We, we have we have many strengths to build on. So uh, you know, I think we have to take stock of what we what we have got in the in the tool bag or the toolkit. And um, one of the things we have is a an amazing network of Aboriginal controlled medical services around the country um, that have been you know on the they're on the ground and they're in the regions. Um, doing the work on a day-to-day -day basis. So I think that anything that we do at a national level has to be be able to make an impact at that local and regional level. So there has to be strong engagement and listening to what is happening in those those different different places. And we need to keep supporting um, the, our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander institutions. And I'd like to see our I'd like to see our NGO sectors, our organisations, institutions expand. I think we should have more of them. Um, but I think there's been a, a tendency for government to want to mainstream a lot of things. And I think that, for me, the strength of having a good Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander sector, of, uh, you know, NGO sector, is that we, they're able to partner and, and support mainstream services to grow and develop their ability to engage and and uh, make their services and uh, programs accessible. So I think we need to keep building on that. We need to keep, you know, there's no end game here. We need to keep developing, evolving our thinking around, um, you know, how we, how we deliver our programs and services. I think we can honour our, uh, our own history, our own um, historical trauma and, and our survival of that. I think we could do, do more of that within our own institutions. Um, and continue to, to uh, think more, I think, laterally around how we govern our institutions. I think we, we, are in, we incorporate our organisations under Corporations Acts and, um, um, you know, the, the, the Council of Associations Acts, the, the Registrar and all of that. And those are, you know, they're really useful because you can hold money and, and all of that. But they, they are Western constructs. Um, you know, I've seen a model out in the Murray Parky region, which is a community governance model based on Aboriginal values and, and processes, and it's been going for 10 years. Um, 16 communities feeding into a regional assembly, not incorporated, um, but, uh, you know, drawing in they, their decision makers. They make decisions about um, what programs and, and what, you know, the way government works in their region, and it's not perfect by any means, and they... You know, they, they still go have a long way to go. But what I've seen out of that program or, or that effort um, is stronger relationships amongst the Aborig Aboriginal people themselves. Um, I've seen people emerge as leaders, young leaders, um, and um, they've achieved regional agreements with state and federal governments over the last 10 years. So they can negotiate... Um, and, uh, and make agreements. And the thing about it is, because it's not incorporated, they, they say the government can't get rid of us. So what they've seen, they've seen changes of government, federal and state level. They've seen restructures in health systems, education systems. Um, but that structure, that, that community governance leadership has remained constant. And that's the thing we have to remember, that doesn't matter what's imposed on us in terms of, um, uh, you know, health pro like programs or, or policies. You know, our communities stay the same. You know, I've, you know, <laughs> I know how our mob think. I've been out there working and people just waiting for the next, <laughs> the next big deal, you know, the next great idea that's going to come through. The community's still there. It doesn't change. Um, and, you know, I think that's, that's a strength for us. We're, you know, we're still here. We've survived, um, you know, a, a amazing assaults on our identity, um, our culture, our traditions. You know, we've, you know, uh, dispossessed of lands and all of that. But here we are, st we're still here making a mark and still thinking about the future. Um, so those are the things that give me hope. And, uh, you know, I think that we can keep building on that. Fantastic. All right, ladies and gentlemen, let's open it up. This is a big topic. Um, we're talking about uh, political leadership. We're talking about 
ownership of data, we're talking about um, cultural models of care and of governance. Do we have any thoughts or questions over here in the front? Good morning all and thank you very much for the wonderful work you're all doing. My name is Vicki Scott and I acknowledge the Coolan people of the land on which we gather. Um, I work with Wendy Wattigo. We co-founded the STARS Institute of Healing and Leadership and we've been working in this area for eight years. The struggle that we've had is about actually finding some ways of measuring the social impact of the work we do. And it's not just about statistics. And we've, worked, we've talked with corporates and philanthropic organisations, and they're also struggling with how to actually measure the difference in a person's life um, about what happens before and what they can then go on and do afterwards. So I, um, I guess my question is, um, is the Healing Foundation or the AIHW doing anything to... Um, because we all know that stories are what inspire people. So... Um, rather than just have data, is there some way of measuring that social impact? Thank you. Um, yeah, I, I, thanks for the question, Vicky. Um, and I mean that. <laughs> I don't mean I'm not being facetious. Um, look, it is hard to measure those things because I think we, um, you know, I've, I've worked out in regional health services and you, you always had to collect data and, and, and it, was, it was quantitative data. So it's numbers and uh, things like occasions of service, health outcomes and things that you can measure in hard numbers. But, uh, you know, a lot of the things that we want to see change in, that we want to, um, that we want to measure, are about what's going on for, you know, someone as an individual or, and their family and, and the community. Um, and I'm not an expert in this, in this space, but I understand the challenge. But, you know, we, some of the things the Healing Foundation has been trying to do is ask these sort of questions. How do you measure the cost of trauma, for example? Um, you know, how do you... Um, uh, you know, if somebody's feeling better... We, we do measure... You know, we ask people... You know, we get feedback about how people, once they've been through a program, you know, what's the change been for them? Are their social and emotional well-being um, improved? And, you know, self-reporting that way, we get really great results. But how does that impact on, you know, how do we actually get a, get a good measure of that? So it's a, it's a work that needs to be developed, I, I think. Um, but I, don't th I would like to see us more... The qualitative data is really important to give life to quantitative data. So I think that evaluating and measuring those qualitative elements of, 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 um, of effort and the changes for people, um, we need to keep elevating that, the story. I think stories are powerful. Um, uh, yesterday we played a story of a, you know, just a couple of um, our Stolen Generations members telling their story. Um, and because it's a living story, uh, it has an immense impact on on people that see those those stories. So we have to keep weaving these different ways of um, of measuring those good outcomes because we see it. You know, you can see it play out in people's lives. They start to do different things. They when when they've had a positive impact, they start to go and seek a service. Um, they start to you know they look at their own education. They become motivated into seeking jobs and things like that. So we know there are positive outcomes. Um, don't know if I've answered your question, probably not, but... Uh... Yeah, there are content and process measures that um, communities can undertake, and there is some work being done in that space in um, Australia and internationally. There's an Indigenous International Health Improvement Project which is looking at those very questions. So I think there's some people in the audience that could speak to that as well. Um, up the back here and then down the front, and that might um, be I too time, would like to pay see. my respect to the people, the traditional owners of the Kulin Nation. Um, I work in the child health sector, and a couple of things strikes me from the contribution, which is fantastic so far. Um, the, the fact that we aim to look at 
how long people live as opposed to the quality of life of the traditional people, not just traditional people, everybody really. And you mentioned um, something about how to do, how to gather um, qualitative data. But we also have the concept of the social determinants of health, which has not been fully explored or data gathered around that as to how that can reflect how well or not well um, the people of the Aboriginal community live. That's one aspect I would like you to, to expand on. But the other aspect is, um, it, it bothers me that despite the fact that after 10 years of Close the Gap program, we have 15,000 children in a, out of home care. The justice, the criminal justice system has absolutely fallen down. And we saw that in the form of Don Dale in um, the, the television program that we saw where children, Aboriginal children, are so ghastly um, treated by the criminal justice system. So I'm just wondering where Close the Gap program intersects with those two issues with children, and also how do you measure the social well-being of traditional people everywhere? I mean, Aboriginal people here are primary. Thank you. Okay, so we've looked at um, how much of the increase in life expectancy is actually um, is actually life with disability. And what we found really is almost 50% of the increase is disability free. And the theories around this is really um, morbidity is compressed in the last few years of life. So you don't actually, if you increase your life expectancy by 10 years over a number of years, not all of it is actually living with bad quality life or with disability. So that's the good news on that front because nobody wants to live longer with, with, you know, with, with the reduced quality of life. In relation to the social determinant work, we've done quite a bit of work to look at, if you look at the health gap between indigenous and non-indigenous Australians, where is the gap coming from? And basically we find the social determinant acknowledging that we did not look at cultural determinants and all this other stuff. It's actually the gap can be closed between 30 to 50 percent based on addressing the social determinant. Health behaviors are about 30 percent, and access to services is around 15 percent. There is still a gap that we can't actually address the whole gap, and that's why I'm thinking there are the other stuff around the racism and cultural determinants that we can't measure now, and therefore we still have an unexplained bit in relation to the social determinants. I think you can answer the second part. Well, yes, I can try. Um, uh, the question was around over-representation in systems, I think, like child out-of-home care justice systems. Look, uh, we know, I think, from the work that's been done in a number of inquiries, the Royal Commission into Aboriginal Deaths in Custody, the seminal Bringing Them Home report, we know the driver of, um, of our people into those systems is this historical trauma. Um, and uh, look, a focus for the Healing Foundation is um, uh, addressing the, the, the survival needs, the needs of, of stolen generations, but also understanding what is the impact of, has been, uh, of that trauma on people. How has it affected and how has it gone from one generation to the next? And I thought um, Karina Walters was able to express that and explain that very well. Um, we haven't done enough of that work in Australia. Um, you know, we, if, if we have, if, if there's, the historical trauma has been about pulling families and communities apart, how do families and communities pass on um, knowledge um, about, you know, how to raise children and how to, how to, um, how to survive in the world and, um, and what are our values and beliefs? And that's, that's the impact of, of um, historical trauma. We haven't done anything about it. And that's why we are seeing um, our people um, overrepresented in in uh, justice systems, um, out of home care, and uh, um, and and this gro but growing issue of suicide in in, in a number of jurisdictions. Um, so how do we how do we stop that? Well, we have to we have to learn from that that uh, historical trauma experience that we have in Australia, and. We have to start putting more support around families and communities 
um, you know, a child protection system is based on a, um, you know, report, substantiate, remove. Um, you know, we need to have more effort around supporting vulnerable families and at-risk families. Um, children are, children do best when they stay in their family. And even if a family isn't, is a little bit vulnerable or at risk, if they're supported, the children can still stay. And most kids coming out of home care, if you talk to them, that's where they would have loved to have stayed. You know, that we're putting kids into um, systems where, the, where we're giving, handing parenting over to the government and the government's not a good parent. Um, a lot of issues tied up in that. I think the thing that's coming through strongly is that Aboriginal communities need to um, get stronger and clearer on our own models of care and our own governance and on what we see as success, how we measure our own success over time um, and measuring ourselves against um, what we consider to be good development. Um, and that, port, that, that part is the bit that's missing. On the other part of it, of course, we need to keep governments to account um, and health services and systems about um, the social determinants of health and about systemic racism. Can I thank our two panellists, please? Can you all join us? Thank you. Um, I, I want to say in particular thank you, Fadwa, for your leadership. You're a non-Aboriginal person who work in this space in a very respectful way, and we appreciate that. Thank you. And to... Yep. And to Richard for your leadership in the Close the Gap, the National Health Leadership Forum and the Healing Foundation. We appreciate your time and effort. Thank you.